off the top. Happy New Year. How were the holidays for you? Um, quite relaxing, actually. Uh, sorting through bins of CDs from my past and just trying to get organized for 2024. I can only imagine what that's like. Look, uh, you and I have known each other a long, long time. You know, I've always had mad respect for you and the things that you do and the work that you do in the in the industry um, as a spokesperson, as a writer, as a journalist, um, as a personality. Um, before we get into, I would say, probably one of the biggest stories, A, that you've done, and B, from 2023, what is it about this side of the business that you love so much? About the trade side? About the industry itself, about being a journalist, being on those red carpets, interviewing people the way you do and getting the 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 core of the story, which not knocking a lot of the young people out there, it's almost like a lost art. I mean, I've been obsessed with music since I was in my early teens. And then I guess when I graduated from university, I became a music trade writer. So that's where my passion is, learning about the industry, how someone gets from A to B. Uh, it's been amazing all these decades to see people that I knew back then now running the top major uh, music companies in the world, whether it's you know management companies, booking agencies, uh, you know, people at Live Nation, there's so many Canadians there, uh, you know, and, and also watch artists as you see yourself, like go from unsigned to signed to sometimes international stardom. Uh, I love it. It's There's no greater industry, in my opinion. There's amazing people in it and you have to be passionate about music and pretty much live it. Okay, now which is which is it? Uh, is Springsteen your all time favorite, or is it like Stones your all time? Like which is uh -oh. it? <laughs> yeah, they're they're both my favorites. I mean, when I was growing up, my bedroom wall was filled with you know just cutouts from magazines yeah. with Stones, like even this big, and then I'd have to rearrange it so that it was like even on the bottom. Um, Springsteen was there too. I love them both. Can't well, well, we love everything that you've done over the years. And like I was alluding to before, you did uh, in a story, and I want you to go from the beginning to this uh, last year in 2023, that was a real impact in the industry itself. Can you talk about it? Because I want you to lead into it. I hope it made an impact. I'm glad people read it. I hope people share it. I hope people continue to read it. Um, it's about an alleged predator in the Canadian music industry by the name of Adrian Strong. He's what is called a radio tracker. He promotes singles to radio, um, but he was probably the top in the pop, like the top 40 world in this country, representing some major, major acts. Uh, his biggest client, Actually, we shouldn't really call him a client because it's not necessarily the artist that hires him, but um, he had, you know, Dead Mouse and The Weeknd and uh, just lots, lots of artists, lots of Canadian artists. Um, so in November 2019, before COVID, um, a woman by the name of Noir, that was her professional name, uh, posted on Instagram about this horrific experience, um, alleging that Adrian Strong drugged, raped, confined her, and um, scalped a piece of her uh, head. Um, it was shared, that actual post, and I at the time tried to write about it and investigate. It was for Billboard, I should say. Uh, I was the Canadian correspondent for Billboard for 13 years. Yeah. My editors are incredible. Um, my one editor, I sent him the post. We talked on the phone. He told me to you know, pursue it. I tried. I ran into some obstacles. Uh, there was someone that was sabotaging me, actually. Um, saying some pretty nasty things about me to Noir. 
and um, she was very hesitant to talk to me at that time. Um, some other people were, I think, trying to uh, look into the story as well. And by the time Noir realized that what this person was um, saying about me was false, and we started a rapport, it was Christmas time. Then, you know, January hit. Um, my aunt had passed away. I went over to the UK, came back, and essentially it was COVID. So everyone kind of retreated into their lives, and me included, uh, you know, trying to deal with that and what was going on. And then, you know, Adrian and his company, DMD, um, continued to get hired. Uh, I was out for lunch with someone. Um, and let me say, I knew Adrian for a couple of decades. You know, I have got texts from him. Uh, I would see him at concerts. I actually saw him a couple of weeks before Noir's post. Um, I was taking a young artist around to meet people in the industry. And we went to Jesse Reyes, and he was there with his mom and sister. And I, you know, even introduced her to him. And um, so, you know, uh, I did know him not well, but well in terms of the industry. And uh, anyway, I was out with a, a mutual friend of his. <laughs> and he just out of the blue said the only person who has benefited from COVID is Adrian Strong, meaning you know, it went away, it disappeared and, and nothing happened and uh, people continued to hire him and, you know, he, he just continued <laughs> to do well. But let me say that he had disappeared right after that post from social media. So at a time when The weekend had blinding lights and was performing on the Super Bowl, he didn't make any posts. Um, anyway, I was in touch with Noir. I um, just started investigating. Uh, and I should also say that back in November, when I was investigating, I did go through his Facebook. You can read the article and you'll see what I discovered in that. Uh, just Google Adrian Strong, Karen Bliss, Billboard, it will come up. But there were some things that came up that um, kind of made me think, yes, I should look into this and one of them was the weekend that she alleges that he did rape and and confine her and drug her there was a post that said noir is the new black and that was on his facebook so i took a screenshot of that there were some other references to some places that she had mentioned like hilton head and uh you know some some other things the uh, marriott hotels um i went through his entire timeline over like mm -hmm. over 10 years um but significantly i also spoke with another um artist at that time off the record and she told me her story and it was uh she had gone through some horrific experiences as well um that story she ended up um speaking to me for the article so that is part of the article uh so you know when there's two people with quite similar stories they don't know each other um that gave me the impetus also to keep going and investigate and that's what i did i didn't have much work you know it was covid my i had the full um support of billboard I could never have done this story in this country for the publications that I uh, actually write for. Um, this was just another level, you know, like uh, Penske has, you know, their own lawyers, Billboard has a lawyer, uh, everything was vetted. Um, they even got me a Canadian lawyer. I, I did reach out over the past, um, over those two years, two plus years, I watched, Every, you know, uh, TV show, series, movie, I watched, you know, panels about um, the Larry Nassar situation and, you know, uh, what was going on in the hockey world uh, with sexual assault. And um, I reached out to Kevin Donovan, who I perceive to be the top investigative journalist in Canada. He writes for The Star. He's 
you know, sent all the pieces on the Sherman uh, murders, and he was extremely helpful, and he suggested uh, his lawyer. So, like, every single sentence you read in that article has been vetted. Um, you know, I had to go back to all the people I interviewed and, you know, fact check and double check and get proof. And I've got screenshots and, you know, yeah, it was a unique experience. Uh, very scary, actually. Uh, very stressful. I couldn't tell anyone or I didn't want to tell anyone. I didn't want to jeopardize the safety of the women. Um, didn't want to jeopardize the, the story. Yeah, it was pretty crazy a couple of years, I have to say. Now, uh, I have to add in, too, that I've known Adrian, like yourself, in the industry for four decades, so I want to add that in first. Second, I want to ask, though, did you reach out to him for an interview to give his side to this? And third question, well, actually, second question is, when this came out, were you in fear of your career of any kind of backlash? So I'll answer the first question about Adrian. If you uh, read the article, um, you'll see that, yes. And also by law, we have um, a responsibility in Canada, a Responsible Journalism Act to reach out to the person. And um, I tried many times, you'll see, uh, when I had the, the base of the story and it was primarily written and I had the go ahead from the lawyers, it was time to reach out and you have to reach out often and you have to give that person ample time to respond. And these aren't um, just, you know, did you rape so-and-so? Did you drug so-and-so? These are, you know, did you meet so-and-so at, you know, this place? Is Rudy talking to Karen right now? Like it, they're, you know, mixed in. It's basically the whole article broken down into each kind of sentence, you know, like, did you meet this person in this year? Did you do this? Did you do that? So he kept putting me off, you know, oh, I'm with family. Oh, I'm in rural UK. Oh, I have to access my uh, computers and cameras. Um, you know, there were times I was like, will you meet here? Like, how's this day? And, you know, you can read, he just never, never did and never responded to the 75 or so um, questions that I had, even the most basic didn't answer, uh, you know, then his attorneys answered. Um, he did end up sending what he perceived to be his evidence and proof. Uh, you can read the article yourself and determine, um, you know, what you think of of that evidence. Um, he sent some photographs um, and a statement. So yeah, I tried probably a dozen times. Oh, I wanted to interview him in person by Zoom, um, by phone. I gave him ample opportunity for a very long time. And during that time that I had no control over because I would have printed the article, you know, within a week, but we couldn't do that. Uh, DMD was scrambling behind the scenes to shut down the company and put Adrian on leave um, because, you know, they, they knew the article was coming out. So. And, uh, and were you uh, worried about uh, a backlash uh, in the industry yeah. towards your career? I said it many times to my editors, this this might end my career, but I was fully prepared and I was okay with that because the story had to be told. He was continuing to get work, um, very successful company. And Noir had come forward very bravely after, you know, this happened to her allegedly in, uh, 2009, I should say, and she felt empowered because of the Me Too movement. If you read the article, she wasn't treated very uh, nicely by the police or the uh, hospitals that she went to. I do have the police records. I have the hospital uh, 
reports as well. So I had all those and her uh, the notes from her social worker. Um, all the women, these encounters changed their lives forever. Um, three of them left Canada. One has returned. Um, they were afraid for their safety, but also he allegedly took videos and photos and they were afraid that he had that and would release them. Uh, that I can imagine is pretty scary. Um, I, yeah, I, I was, you know, I did think it, it could end my career for sure. What has been the outcome for yourself? What have been, I've read some of the comments. Um, and for what I've read, everything has been positive on the work that you've done. What have you received and read? I received incredible messages. I remember I started crying <laughs> the very first one that I got. Um, well, and, and sorry to interrupt you. Was that crying because of a relief, like because you were so tense about the story itself? And then to finally hear something on a positive side for your work, was that more like a cry of relief? It came from a colleague at Billboard. And I think just she understood what went into investigating the article and how incredibly stressful and all consuming it was and um to the point you know i'm a, a i live by myself female i park in the back you know <laughs> of my house and um yeah it, it's just hearing stories from a fellow woman of what they experienced at the hands of a of a man, uh, allegedly, I should say, um, it is very very difficult to hear those stories, and this is you know, five six hours of an interview with Nuar, um, two three hours of a Zoom with one of the women that you'll see that actually uh, decided not to have her full story told. Um, another woman that uh, he managed at the time and, you know, alleged co coercion was involved. It's horrific. And it's really, it takes a lot out of you to, to hear those stories. So when someone even, you know, every week or every couple of weeks, even now I, I get um, a email or when I run into someone, someone brings it up. Um, I have had some backlash, um, which is upsetting. I have had men um, say these types of stories should not be tried in the news. But, you know, if you look at Epstein, Jacob Hogarth, Jean Gameshi, uh, Weinstein, they all started from journalism. You know, the, the gymnastics case, the, the Hockey Canada um, that's where they start. I um, stand by the story. Billboard, one of the top U.S. publications in our industry, if not the top, I would say, stood by me. That meant a lot. Um, the amount of work that, that they uh, put in and supported me on and the editors I had, um, the lawyers, the time, just everything even you know a safety expert um i can't even tell you the amount the, like of support i got like it was it was pretty incredible and um you know i didn't get one message from anyone at dmd saying thank you for doing this or oh my god i had no idea or we wish we did know or i'm sorry we didn't pay any attention to new artist post in 2019 not one message nothing um yeah I, I, it's been there's been a bit i'm sure and uh work is tough out there right now and i don't know if it has to do with this story or not how has it changed you personally because we all have that story i feel like this one is your 
that story? How has it changed you? Uh, I don't, all I know is um, it was the most stressful two or three years that I've ever experienced, like living by myself, keeping this all in. I actually would hallucinate him kind of like I'd be walking down the street and like see him, you know, or think I, I said, no, that sounds crazy. I didn't really, but it was like, I was nervous or I'd be at a ball game and there's so many people that look like him and um, go to the weekend concert at Rogers Center. And um, I was scared to tell you the truth during the time that only the women and the people I had interviewed. And there are some men I interviewed for the story too. And, you know, um, and he didn't know until I think March or April. And that was a scary time between the time that he knew and the women, but no one else. Um, yeah, I, 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 I don't know. It, it's, I'm proud of myself for doing it. I would do it all again. Um, it, it was stressful and um, yeah, I don't know. <laughs> then I'm, let me I'm, ask I'm, you I'm, this. I'm coming out of it now. Like I yeah. think next year will be different, but it, it really bothers me. I have to say that I don't feel an impact. I, I don't know what could have been done, but I, I, it bothers me. And the more people tell me stories, the more I know of people that didn't necessarily know the alleged rape that he, you know, the women say that he, he perpetrated, but um, there's definitely some stories that took place in public that, you know, if true, those people that witnessed it should have done something and not continue to hire DMD. Um, you know, you can read the story and determine for yourself, like who might have known what or seen some things that, you know, weren't those ultimate um, horrific acts that a lot of the women, you know, say that he did. But there's other things that even at face value, um he's yeah i don't it's get tough. me started on that yeah, yeah. I have to, you know i have to obviously be very careful about what i say of course but let me let me let me let me throw this last question over to you and, and before we end this i gotta say thank you uh for being brave enough to do this interview with me on zoom so i really want to say thank you you know i've i've always like i said mad respect always big support for you. What advice can you give other, not just journalists, but female journalists who may find themselves in a position where they could uh, go and investigate a story like this or anything? What advice can you give them? Keep going, keep digging. Um, you know, this is not my beat. I'm not an investigative journalist. You know, I have such respect for someone like Kevin Donovan and the work that he does. And, um, you know, the, I can't remember her name right now, the woman that, that uh, also was working on, I think the Jean Gameshi uh, story and, um, you know, uh, Rowan, um, Pharaoh who, you know, didn't let up with the Weinstein story, even though other journalists had tried and failed before beforehand um i i wish in this country that the major outlets had more money to investigate these types of stories and they weren't so afraid and timid um it obviously took a lot of work and expertise and not many outlets that i work for have that um kind of skill um and know-how and knowledge and making sure that I did this properly and right and on the level and that every single line was, was vetted, you know, it was frustrating at times. I was, you know, I frustrated them for sure. Some, there were some battles, um, some things that, you know, I didn't understand why they were asking or why I had to keep getting this, you know, keep going back and back and back to get more and more info. And, um, 
Yeah, I don't know. It, the thing is, and this is this is how I feel. If I lose my gig, which I love because of this story, I'm okay. Because I can't live with myself having not done this. And if he was still working in the music industry, um, and you know, knowing what these women have alleged, I think that there should be a responsibility by these companies to take these things seriously and have the guts to um, step away and not use them. To this day, I've heard men say, well, there isn't anyone in this country that works radio, that works pop radio. Really? That's, you know, that's what's most important to you? Yeah. And you know what? That is what's most important to them. I've had someone tell me that I cost them $150,000, you know? Wow. No, I did not. Adrian did. So you can't change someone's moral compass, right? Um, self-interest is, uh, can be a dangerous thing and, uh, people have to live with themselves, right? You gotta do what you feel is, is right. And you definitely did. I want to say, I am so proud of you. Um, you're an amazing person. You're an amazing journalist. You are needed in this industry. I know it's going to flourish even more, but this is probably like I, I think I was one of the first people when you posted it was like shared it and said must read and sent you a note saying wow you know what what an incredible story that you helped put out there so I gotta say thank you for this interview but thank you for what you have done for this injured industry not just the music industry, but for journalism as well. Congratulations. And thank you so much for this. Thanks, Brady. I really appreciate that you did read it for one, because it's long and a hard read and that you shared it because some people, you know, they just sent me messages privately and didn't have the, for whatever reason, didn't, didn't share it. So. Always thanks. got you back. Thanks for having me on. <laughs>